When you think back to your youth, that probably highlights you know, days by the seaside, parties, picnics. Well, there was nothing like that under the Nazis. You couldn't do it. And I can't remember from that time anything that a child might call fun. Before the war, um, I worked in an office and then I had call-up papers and it wasn't really what I wanted, but we had no choice in those days. We had to do something important. From day to day, you accepted what you were doing. You accepted it was life. You never thought about life back home. You just thought of what you were doing at the time. There was a terrible uh, lot of sadness and life lost. Things said, things done that never ought to be said or done and never want to be repeated. When I speak about it, I always have this slight feeling of shame that when others suffered so much during the war, I, I didn't. The war changed my life. It offered me something that I would never have had otherwise. It also gave me a, gave me a taste of travel too. I am Jack and I serve with the 4th Battalion, Somerset Light Infantry, from April 1938 until March 1946. To be under fire for the first time is pretty ghastly. You didn't think about being hit. That was the last thing you thought about. All you thought about, I think, myself, how can I get out of this lot? I got away with a one on ill one one two. The corn was about two and a half feet high. There was chaps uh, being shot left, right, and centre. That was a, a very, very near miss. I believe the German aimed at me, but me being so thin at that time, he, he missed me. <laughs> Shortly afterwards, they captured a young German, only about sixteen. They said, well, they've just shot um, Tr Trixie. We will shoot him. No, no, no. I said, you can't do that. I said, no, no, no. Well, with this young chap, I can see it now. He took some pictures out of his pocket showing us his mum and dad. I said, how can you shoot somebody like that? I said, they were no more than what we were. So anyway, he, as far as I know, the chap, I hope, lived to a ripe old age. My name is Rene. During the war, uh, 1943, I joined the Women's Land Army. I was born in Wolverhampton and I went to school there and was brought up there with my sister. I never ever thought that I would leave there. Some wanted to do tractor driving, some wanted to do uh, wood cutting, uh, but none of us wanted cows. We were all townies and we were really, really scared of the animals. We were all there for dairy work, doing the machine milking. I found it very interesting, and I got on with it. I lost my fear of the cows, which was one thing that we had to get used to. Country life is much slower than town life. And that gradually uh, wore itself onto your personality. And you learn to be uh, more dependable, more honest, I suppose. It just changed your character. I changed completely. I know I did. But I'm, it was a good change. I'm Colin. I joined the army on the 18th of June, 
1942. As soon as we entered the cornfield for Hill 112, the whole area was full of smoke. And it began to realize then the horror of battle. Many cries of SB stretcher bearer was being heard. Quite a lot of the men was scarred really in their mind. They really uh, was in poor shape. On this particular day, the rest of my section went off on their journey. They come back in my room 10 o'clock one night, laughing and joking what had happened. And then all of a sudden there was a flash and a sound of machine gun and a stead gun was dropped and came across and hit me in the leg, sat on my bed. The next, I knew I was in cellar hospital and they decided to operate and take my leg off. I was born 1923, May the 2nd. May the 2nd that year, nearing Brenham, I was 22. Uh, what was my life? Was I going to be able to do anything? I had that challenge. And I took the challenge. And I come through. I struck up a friendship with this lady taxi driver. People was kissing under a mistletoe. And we kissed for the first time. And we kind of knew that we was going to be together. My name is Betty. Uh, during the war, I was a, a, a driver of heavy vehicles in convoy and many other duties. And uh, after the war, I went to Germany uh, to work with the uh, British Control Commission for Germany. I remember one, one trip I loved particularly. That was over Shap. I remember racing over Shap, so many of us, one after the other. And I thought, this is living. I'm so glad I'm no longer a civil servant. <laughs> we all knew we had to win the war. We worked all hours and we did what was necessary. After the war, that spirit ebbed away somehow. The desire to work hard had gone from us. Everybody's idea was to get out of the army, go back to Civvy Street and start life again. But the mere thought of it horrified me. To go back to pen pushing when I'd, when I'd lived such a different life for four years. To me, I was completely free. I could do as I wished, and that's a wonderful feeling to have when you're, what was I, 26 when I went to Germany. I went over as a welfare officer. Germany was in an absolute mess. The infrastructure had, had collapsed. When I first went there, of course, I thought I'm going to, to work among the people who've just been bombing us. But once I, I, once I grew to know the people I was working amongst, they were just human beings. And when human beings are starving, you don't think of, of principles and and hatred and such like. My name's Paul Heim. I was born on the 23rd of May, 1932 in Vienna, when uh, the catastrophic events of the Germans 
the Nazis occupying Austria occurred. One can remember uh, grown-ups being worried, having a great fear of, fear of events, a great feeling of foreboding. Even as a child, you sensed that. And I remember in particular how the Nazi teachers were of an unspeakable brutality to the little children. I can hear the little children now uh, begging not to be punished in the ways that they had. Generally speaking, it, it was difficult to envisage leaving. And of course, they made it very difficult for you. We succeeded in actually getting papers and we actually got on the train, went to Trieste, uh, and then by steamer to Cyprus, leaving behind the other members of my family. We hoped that they would join us, uh, but my, my grandparents were, were gassed by the Germans. Being a refugee changes your perspectives entirely, so you're really running, as it were, towards an uncertain destination. But what you do know is that you're running away from something. You're running away from circumstances where you are a hate object. As far as this country is concerned, certainly I owe it everything, because if Britain had not fought against Hitler and beaten them, I would have been captured and certainly I would have been killed, as were six million other, other people. The spirit of the people in those days, something inside you made you feel you've got to do it for our country. And I think this is what got us through. Perhaps I'm one of those chaps that never dwelt on very much. It, as far as I know, it was a damn good job of war finished because we were just about had enough of it by that time. There's not a day that one doesn't think of the people who died. I'm a grandfather myself now, and I know what it's like, and how much pleasure you get from your grandchildren. Now, my grandfather was deprived of that. I've got four grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren, which, if anything happens, yeah, um, I never want to see them uh, have to go through what I went through. I would have been such a different person, I think, if I'd stayed in the civil service. Would I have realised that if the war hadn't come, I would have remained there and my life would have been a, as narrow as I saw their lives, instead of which the world opened for me. We have, have found Somerset to be such a welcoming place, such an egalitarian place, such a sincere place, it's an incredibly open society, and uh, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, we're deeply grateful. That is, that is my story of the war. That's how I remember the war. <laughs>